great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Now your many blessings, angels will attend, help and comfort give you through your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God had done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God had done. Great singing, please be seated. All right, let's go ahead and take our Bibles tonight. Let's go to the book of Galatians, chapter 5. Once again, we'll be starting here and going to another verse here in just a moment. But there was a captain one time of a ship that looked into the dark night and saw very faint lights in the distance. Immediately, he told his signal, signal man to send a message to that light. He said, "After you alter your course 10 degrees south. Well, there was a message that was promptly returned and was received by the ship that said this, Alter your course 10 degrees north. Well, the captain was quite angered by this, and his command was the, had been ignored, so he sent a second message. He said, Alter your course 10 degrees south. I am the captain. Soon another message was received. Alter your course 10 degrees north. I am Seaman 3rd Class Jones. Immediately the captain sent the third message, knowing the fear it would evoke. Alter your course 10 degrees south. I am a battleship. Then the reply came, alter your course 10 degrees north, I am a lighthouse. Ooh. In the midst of our dark and foggy times, all sorts of voices are shouting into the night, shouting orders into the night, telling us what to do, how to adjust our lives, and out of the darkness, one voice signals something quite opposite to the rest. Something almost absurd, but the voice happens to be the light of the world, and we ignore it to our own peril. Tonight, I want to continue my thoughts from last week in regards to our daily walk in the Spirit and how that walk is vital to our daily victory over sin. And I want to expound further, though, on how we stay in line with the Spirit as the devil is going to do everything he can to try to knock us off course and how we can fight against that so that we don't get knocked off course, but we stay in line and stay walking in the Spirit, stay victorious, as it were. But it really all comes down to one single concept or word, if you will, and simply this, submit. Submission to God. And we'll see that more clearly tonight, I hope. Now, Galatians 5, we've been here for some time, Use this as springboard, verse, and I will bit tonight, but then we're going to go to James 4, and it's really what we're going to focus on more than anything. It says here in Galatians 5, verse 16, This I say, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are the contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. So in these verses, we understand that you got two opposing ways in which we can walk. We can walk in the Spirit or we can walk after the flesh. Choice is really ours. And you see the corresponding results of both. You can walk in the flesh and you have all the, these negative things, or we can walk in the Spirit and we can have the fruit of the Spirit, which are very positive and wonderful things to experience. But it comes down to what we see in James chapter 4 and verse 7 that's going to be crucial in us being able to walk in the Spirit effectively. And, and if you go there to the book of James, in chapter 4 and verse 7, it says very plainly, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. 
Resist the devil and he will flee from you. This is where the battle takes place in keeping us in line with the Spirit. And today I'd like to talk a little bit more about that as we talk about walking daily with the Spirit. And this will be part two of, from last time. So let's go ahead and pray and we'll get into the service tonight. Father, we're thankful to be able to be in God's house tonight. Thank you for the warm building. Thank you for these folks that made it out. And do pray that you just bless our time as we collect together. May, may Satan's uh, attempts at distracting us be bound through the blood of Christ. May you have full our full attention tonight, both mine and the congregation, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I imagine every person here tonight wants to enjoy the promised blessings of a real relationship with God. I mean, you came to Christ kind of with that expectation that that's what you're looking for, that you would find forgiveness for all that you've ever done and the opportunity to really know the Creator God. For me growing up, God wasn't all that exciting. Church was boring, and I had a lot of other things I wanted to do with my life, but when I came to Christ, I came because I believed that what the Bible said was right about God, though it wasn't what I had been taught in my religion growing up. And over the years, I've tried to learn how to get what God has for me. I don't think there's anything wrong with that per se. And, I, and, I, and I've come to the point where if something isn't working in my Christian life, I don't want to be, I'm going to throw God to the side and just say forget it. I want to try to figure it out. I want to try to, I like the word troubleshoot. And, and try to troubleshoot what the issue is. And, and sometimes that, that requires some work, some effort, some seeking, some asking some questions seeking and researching out answers. And, and that's a good thing. We ought to be pursuant of truth. I think that's a very important attitude to have. Because our Christianity is supposed to work. In other words, it's supposed to enable us to, to live in a, on a better plane in life and prepare us for eternity. And to, and to figure out why we're here and all the major important questions of our life. If our Christianity doesn't do that, then our Christianity isn't going to help us at all. And it's really and got not a lot of value to it. But it's supposed to be the most fulfilling life that doesn't require everything being perfect in my world. That's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a fulfilling life. It's supposed to be something that's, that uh, enables me to get up in the morning, a reason to live, to find hope, even when everything isn't right in my life. In other words, the, the world isn't perfect. And it never will be, by the way. You know, I have the greatest thing to live for, and that's God himself, and so do you. There's nothing better and bigger than God to live for. And I want what God is offering to me and to anybody is, is this full relationship that meets every need that I have in my life. Because to me, to be dependent upon things in this world to meet every need that I have, I'm going to be sorely disappointed, just as probably we've all been, to find needs met by whatever it is in this world. And people get real bitter at other people because this, we, they're not getting certain needs met, but the problem is you're looking to get your needs met by people which are very flawed or by things in this world that you cannot control ultimately. You need something higher than that. And that's what God is offering in, in many ways. There's a lot that God, the, the package that God gives us at salvation is beyond any benefit package you could get at any job or any retirement package you could get at any job. It really is. It, it's incredible. And we're really trying to unwrap it and understand it and apply it, not just for our own benefit, but really so that we can bring God glory so we, don't, we can have a good testimony and that we can reach others for the gospel's sake. Because if our Christianity doesn't work for us, I've said this before, why would it work for, and why would it draw anybody else to him, right? If we have to go back to the world to find fulfillment, if we have to go back to the world to find love and all these different things, then really what you quote unquote received really was just a waste. You're supposed to be able to find all in him. Everything that you need, whatever it is. And... Uh, so if we got a problem, we, we, want to, we want to try to fix that. We have the greatest thing to live for. And we have a meaningful life from God. We get wisdom to make decisions, peace in the midst of our storms, and a hope for all eternity. 
And I believe it's the saddest thing in the world when God's people aren't experiencing that. It really is. It's a sad thing when God's people aren't getting this. And you can see it in their lives, and you can see it in their face. When they, when they come to church or, or when they're out and about, they're just not joyful. And it's not supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be where there's some joy. I can, it's not that we don't ever get sad. Don't misunderstand that. But at the same time, too, we've got so much in God. And to be robbed of that is, is really a sad ordeal. Living in total defeat every single day, no joy in life. The relationship with God is at best rocky. And again, as I put it, simply Christianity doesn't seem to work for them. And what always will happen is that they will always go back to the world. Thinking everything is going to be better in doing so. But the Bible says that that is actually going to land them in a worse set of conditions. Peter mentions this in 2 Peter. I just want to flip back, um, excuse me, flip ahead a book. To, or two, I should say. 2 Peter chapter 2. And maybe you've read this before. Think about what... A, in the context of what I'm talking about here, is when somebody gets saved and they, they've tasted the good things of God, but for whatever reason, they don't learn to walk in the Spirit, they don't have a real good relationship with God, and, and they're trying to live the Christian life in the flesh, as we've talked about in this series, and it gets to be such a grind, they just begin to say, this just isn't worth it anymore, and then they begin to turn away. And, and notice what it says here in verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein. In other words, they go back and get entangled in all the stuff that they had once escaped and overcome by them. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. You see that? That's pretty strong, isn't it? It's saying... You, because it goes on and says, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, in other words, known what's right, than after they have known it, to reject it. To turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. And in verse 22, he quotes a proverb in what this is like. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire, or in the mud. <laughs> What it's saying here is this. If you know better and turn from it because of whatever reason, the situation will be far worse for you because you're doing it not out of ignorance, but out of will. And, and God holds us accountable for what we know. What we know. If we know better, and you know, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin, Right? So the only way in the Christian life to go is onward and upward, not backward and downward. You know, but but it can get that way for some people if they are getting in this grind where they're not getting the strength they need to live for the Lord and to live righteously and to grow and things like that from that daily intimate relationship with God. This is why it's so vital. We want to keep pushing people this way. We don't want people to go down that way. But there are plenty of examples like that. And that's what we're trying to avoid tonight. If you go to the book of Hebrews, flip back and you got the book of Hebrews, there's, there's some similar language mentioned here. And maybe you've, you've read this before but never put this together. But it says here, if you read the context beforehand, it talks about letting us draw near with a true heart of faith and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together to encourage one another in the times in which we're living. Again, it's, I believe it's encouraging uh, being involved in a local church, being faithful there and assembling there. Because it goes on to verse 26, because uh, it says, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, in other words, we willfully choose to reject the things that we know is right, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a, fear, a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden under foot the Son of God, 
and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified and a holy thing, and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. In other words, uh, God doesn't feel very pleased that when we know better and we, we reject him, we start trodden under him, trodden Jesus under our feet because we think we know better. He said, this is not going to end good for you. It goes on and says in verse 30, For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. <laughs> That's why it's like, whoa, just a minute. In other words, you and I can't afford to backslide. You and I cannot afford to be stagnant spiritually. We have to be going onward and upward in the way that the Lord wants us to go. And that means growing and flourishing. It doesn't mean we're not going to be, make mistakes and sin, but the thing is, we want, in order to stay on that pathway, you and I have to be empowered by the Spirit of God to do that. And that comes from a daily cultivated walk with Him. The only way to get everything that God has for us is that way. Because once we have tr tasted truth and go back, a person is never the same. They're never the same. And the more you know and turn on, the more accountable you become and more sorely the judgment. Jesus said in Luke 12, 47, 48, And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did not commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whom much, whomsoever much is given... Of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of them they will ask the more. This is all about accountability and responsibility. The more you know, the more you understand, the more you and I are accountable to God versus other people. And if we, if we know better and choose to go against it, against God's word, then you know what? We're going to face this, the stronger punishment. It's like this, you know, you don't expect as much out of a two-year-old as you would a 12-year-old, right? I mean, how could you? They, they, the 12-year-old should know better in certain areas versus the two-year-old. That's just common sense. It's kind of the same idea. If you know better and I know better about certain things and we go, uh, and we go forward anyways, boy, they, then we have a, we're, the Lord has more that he can pour out against us. The only way to get everything God has for us in the Christian life is to learn how to daily walk in the Spirit. That's the only way that's going to prevent you and I from going backwards and getting our heads turned spiritually. And through the power of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is experienced and the strength of character that accompanies it. Do you understand what I mean by that? The strength of character. In other words, the desire and the power to do it. Joyfully. That only comes through the Spirit's work in your heart. And like I said, there is a devil out there that will do his utmost best to get us turned sideways spiritually and out of sync with God. He's trying to knock you and I off course every single day. And we must learn how to deal with him so that our walk can stay steady. Remember 1 Peter, if you want to flip over there, 1 Peter chapter 5. In verse 8, Peter warns here, he says in verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So we're told here we, we need to be able to fight him, resist him, steadfast him or steadfastly, not, not, wimp, not, not being a wimp, if you will, against him. Let's consider tonight the vital principle of how we do that, and that's being in submission to God, especially when the devil comes knocking on your heart's door. As we see, first off, I, I want to continue on the thought of the satanic problem now, I think most of us understand this tonight, that our greatest enemy is Satan himself. Ephesians 6, 12, where we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's the devil and his, uh, his cohorts. And once we've been saved, Satan, of course, can't take us to hell, thankfully, but instead he wants to ruin our lives and our testimonies. I mean, that's what he's, he, he, he will target you now. 
Sad to say he's been successful in too many lives of God's people. The thing we have to realize is that we don't have to be defeated by him tonight. There's nobody that has to be defeated. But we do have to learn how to fight him. All right? And you don't fight him by slugging it out or, you know, out screaming the devil or anything like that. You don't do it with holy water or any other kind of weird medieval idea that's come up over the years. Garlic, whatever, you know. You don't, you don't do it that way. You have to learn how to fight. Psalm 144, verse 1, Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. You're called to be a soldier. That means you have to learn how to fight. You have to learn how to fight. Because the devil will come after you and I. He will. He comes after me every week, as he does you. Some people just aren't aware of it. Now, I'm not trying to make, make, a, make him bigger than what he is, but I'm just trying to say, you know, we, we deal with this on a regular basis more than we realize. The devil will come after you and I, and the target gets bigger on your back the higher you go spiritually, by the way. The, the more intense it gets. Because the more influence you have, the more preeminence or prominence you have, of course, if Satan can take you down, he, he'll take everyone down or damage everyone that you influence. And that happens, unfortunately. Well, then people say, well, I won't try to go higher for God. Well, that means you've been neutralized, actually. And we'll, account, we'll give an account in eternity for that. As we've seen, it won't be a pretty one either. The better idea is to learn how to resist the devil, as First Peter, as First Peter five, nine tells us, whom resists steadfast in the faith. Resist the devil, James four seven. He shall flee from you. It's God's will we resist. And what is Satan going to do? Well, what he's going to try to do in general here, he's going to try to tempt you and I to sin against God. And, and when he is successful, he's going to try to keep us going in that sin, whatever it is. Because what he wants to do is get you and I going in that sin to build an addiction. An addiction is, is our inability to say no to something. Any type of sin can be an addiction. Any type of sin that whatsoever can be an addiction. And what he wants to do is, is get us to that point in one or more areas. And if he can get successful in one area, it will bleed into another area, and to another area, and to another area. Sin never stays singular. It always has roots and tentacles that grow every which direction. With the goal of destroying our lives and making it an utter embarrassment for Jesus Christ. Everybody here has probably heard at some point how Christians are hypocrites. Or, or I've seen the mockery when somebody falls into sin and, oh, so-and-so is such a, was such a big Christian or a good Christian. Guess they weren't really that way. What happens? Satan will always capitalize on a Christian that fails. Oh, he does. He will always capitalize on that. And uh, that failure didn't happen overnight either. It was little submissions to sin over and over and over again that got bigger and bigger and bigger and snowballed and eventually it came out. But he, he is on a seek and destroy mission against you and I. Victory in the Christian life is simply the capacity to resist the temptations and not fall for them and instead we submit to God and resist him and do right. And Satan is strategic. You know where he targets our, his temptations at are the areas in which you and I, he knows we're weak. You know, he's got a whole uh, scouting report on you and I. He's been watching you for a long time. He knows uh, all those little hurts and all those different things that, you, that occurred in your life and in my life over the years. He, he knows what we have been prone to fall towards. He knows what buttons to push in our lives where we are weak. And that's what he will target. 
He will target those things. And in essence, he targets our lusts. That's what he goes after. In other words, these are the sins we tend to gravitate to more than others, maybe. You know, for some people, as an example, alcohol would not be that big of a temptation, but, but the opportunity to do something else might be. Maybe pornography, or maybe, or maybe uh, you know, something of a self-gratifying nature. You know, whatever it might be. I'm just saying that Satan knows where our weaknesses are, and he will make sure to craft temptation to come across your way. He, he'll craft an enticing temptation so that we would be more prone to fall for it. My pastor used to always say it this way, all of Satan's apples have worms. All of Satan's apples have worms. And it's so true. Yeah, the, the, the apples look nice and shiny, but you bite into it and you bite into a mess. And what he likes to do as well is put what, what might be called outside pressure upon our lives by, the, by suggestive thoughts. Oh, has the devil ever sat on your shoulder and told you things and got your mind going in a direction towards that temptation or something else? I mean, you can just be sitting there and all of a sudden your mind starts going in a different direction and goes down a bad direction. Let's just put it that way. And that's suggestive thoughts. And that's where it always starts. Satan can't make you and I do anything, but he'll plague our minds with tempting thoughts or angry thoughts or stirred up thoughts. That's why we've got to shut the door on those things so that he no longer has the opportunity to do that. But every person here, you've probably been tormented at some point on some thoughts. Have you ever been, ever been sitting there and all of a sudden you begin to remember how somebody did you dirty and you're bitter at them and all of a sudden those negative thoughts start popping into your mind and heart and, and it just kind of starts spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning and you're just like, grr, 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 grr. Yeah, I'm guessing it's happened at least once to somebody here. Or you're sitting there and, and something comes to your mind and and you just keep thinking on it, and thinking on it, thinking on it, and it, and it just drives you in, in one dire emotional direction or another. Or, or maybe you start thinking to yourself, uh, you know, negative, uh, negative things about yourself. Oh, yeah, you're worthless. You, you're nothing. You're a nobody. You're going to amount to nothing. Maybe that's because of some of the things you heard as a kid. But we know that that's not true if we're in Christ. You know, it's all satanic suggestions that are designed to push you in the direction of sin, to get your emotions moving in such a way that it will steamroll through your will, like a train. Your emotions can act a lot like a train. They're hard to stop once they get bowling forward, especially people who are highly emotional. I mean, it's just like a freight train. And it takes a little bit of time for that to settle down. But what gets that started? Well, these satanic suggestions that sit on, you know, they sit on your, he sits on your shoulder and tells you whatever it is that he's trying to get you to do or get you down or get you to quit. Again, Satan can't make you do anything, but he'll plague your mind and he'll put that outside pressure in there to where he will try to get your emotions moving in a certain direction that will act like a wrecking ball against our will until our will caves. We have to nip the, the thoughts in the bud <laughs> before they're acted out. The minute we notice it, the minute it becomes apparent to us, okay, something's not right here, instead of being sitting on those things and dwelling on them for so long. But this is his attack method, more primarily, is the thought life. People who struggle in their Christian life is because they don't know how to take their thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. And their thoughts control them every single moment of the day. And I'll guarantee you, most of those thoughts are negative in some capacity. They're just negative. 
about themselves, about God, about their life, about everything that there is. And it's, it, it hurts them. And that's why we've got to nip the, the thoughts in the bud early. Whenever we start getting thoughts that stir up those negative emotions or wrong passions, they have a satanic origin. What he's trying to do is move us away from God, move us to our sin, so that we make some really bad choices in life. It's been said the worst choices you make in life will be those that are emotionally driven. Oh, they will be. Every last one of them. You watch somebody who's hyper-emotional, watch out, they make a lot of bad choices because they do what they feel at the moment without any thought of reason. We don't have to be that way. But there is a devil that will try to stir all that up. Well, secondly, let's talk about the submission principle. How do we resist that? James 4, 7. Just flip back there quick. The first thing that is mentioned here, and the most important thing, is that we submit ourselves to God. When Satan comes at us, it's time to take control of our thoughts and submit them to God. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. In other words, we, we have to take those thoughts captive. In other words, okay, we're not going to go that direction. I'm gonna, before this train takes off, we're going to stop it right here and say, ah, uh -uh, we're not going there. But the, before we can do that, before we can resist Satan, we have to consciously, with our own will, doesn't mean you're going to necessarily feel it or feel like it, but consciously, with our own will, verbalize our rejection of that temptation. In other words, God, I'm sorry for thinking that wicked thought that just came through my mind. I'm choosing to submit this to you. That's where you start. I'm choosing to submit this to you. Now, your emotions may have already gotten going, but you don't have to follow that train down that right. We're trying to stop the train before it leaves the depot, so to say. God, I'm sorry. I submit this over to you. When we don't submit, we get out of sync with God, and we are no longer walking in the Spirit. We have crossed over to walking in the flesh. And if we don't stop it, then Satan will ride the wave of hurling temptations as long as he can. <laughs> He'll let the train ride. You ever had days where all you think about are negative things, and it's just like, I just can't get out of it? The train has left the depot, and it's barreling down the track and Satan's more than happy to keep throwing the coal in to keep it moving. Do you understand what I mean by that? It's just, I mean, he'll just keep f filling it in because once it gets cruising speed, it's pretty easy for him. It's hard for us to stop that train of thought. The oppression, those oppressive thoughts can feel heavy and at times we can even feel pinned emotionally. I can, I can testify, I've felt that way before. You feel like, I just can't get up. But the truth is, we don't have to stay there. We can claim truths from God's word and verbalize them out loud in prayer. You know, I don't have to submit to this temptation. I've been delivered from that. You've been delivered from that, just like I have. So what can I do? Start quoting some verses. Start praying out loud. Use your sword. It's like, like this. Satan comes at us. And he's, he's charging with his sword. We've got a sword here that would just knock him off. And we just leave it there at the side. You've got to learn how to pick it up and use it. And you use it by simply expressing it. Praying and all persevere. Or as it mentions in Ephesians 6, praying with all perseverance and supplication in the Spirit. Prayer is the, the, is the activity of the, of the fight, if you will. Prayer is the battle. And you can quote verses, you can claim your victory. Again, so many people don't pick up their sword because they feel dumb doing it. But you can't beat Satan without the sword declaring your submission to God. You can't do it. Walking in the Spirit is characterized by our heart-level submission to God moment by moment. Satan is trying to knock us off that 
track, if you will. And when Satan gets us to sin, we are knocking, we, we are getting knocked off our walk. And to get back on, we have to confess, repent, and move forward. The better way is not to get knocked off to begin with by stopping things at the thought level by verbalizing our submission to God. Another thing should, that we should be, we should ask God is what can I praise and thank Him for? And what He brings to mind at that moment, praise and thank Him for it. <laughs> you know, Dr. Coomer will have here in just a week or two, and I got actually a lot of material I've used to study for this series I've gotten from him. I can't claim originality from it. But there's a lot of good truth in this, in the sense that, that what praise and thanksgiving do is decentralize itself and puts our minds and hearts back on God, where it needs to be. When we're thinking all negative and all down and all out and about, guess what we're thinking about? Poor me. We need to look back to him. We need to look back to him. In fact, stay, if we ask questions of God, it's actually a form of submission itself. That's why we say, God, what can I praise you for? What can I thank you for? We're saying, Lord, I, I, what I can do, those things I will do. Or I'm asking God what to do with the intent on doing them. When we begin to praise and thank God, again, a decentralized self, Satan tempts us. It's his way of trying to get us to elevate self-desire over God's desire. And when we submit to God and praise and thank him, the focus of our mind, again, goes back to God and off the temptation. Just what we see in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, casting down imaginations and every high thought that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. All that stuff Satan is hurling at you and I in our thought life is trying to exalt itself against God. But we want to cast that down. And we have the power to make the choice to do that and to bring ourselves back into alignment with God. The greatest reason for sin's dominance in the life of any Christian is linked to their thought life and how much control they have of that. Whether a Christian has submitted it to God or allowing it to run wild in their lives. We can't control what thoughts come into our minds. You can't. But you, don't, you and I don't need to let them make a nest there and let them fester and grow. Walking daily in the Spirit requires us moment by moment to be submitted to God. And when Satan seeks to disrupt the harmony with tempting negative thoughts, our course of action is to verbally declare our submission to God, seek forgiveness, and ask God what we can praise and thank Him for. It's what it, uh, it amounts to. In areas where we have had struggle in, you might f be finding yourself doing that multiple times in a given hour. Remember, when, how, did, how did Jesus handle Satan? The, the scriptures he quoted. Get thee behind me, Satan. He resisted the devil. He was in submission to the Father. He resisted the devil. He used the word of God. And, but Satan came at him three times and then departed from him for a while. By the way, the more victories you score in an area, particularly one that you have struggled with over the course of a few days, few weeks, or whatever, the easier it will eventually get. or Because Satan will eventually begin to realize he can't get you at that area anymore. But at the minute you, you fall for a temptation every time, I'll tell you, he'll hit that every single time that he can until you and I slam the door in his face with our submission. That's what it amounts to. Again, don't be surprised if in some areas you have to fight that multiple times in a given day, but it's worth the battle because the only other option is defeat. And that's an unacceptable option for us because we do not want to live our lives in constant defeat, constant dismay, knocked out of the will of God, being a, a depressed, discouraged, downcast, defeated Christian that honestly doesn't have a whole lot to live for 
except themselves, which is always a dead end anyways. Don't stop fighting. Don't stop resisting. It's a battle every single day, but the battle is the Lord's, and he will empower you to get the victory that you need in whatever area it is so that you and I can stay aligned with the Spirit. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Let's take a few moments to stand to our feet as our heads are bowed and eyes are closed for a few seconds as the pianist comes to play. But I want to give us an opportunity to talk to God. Maybe tonight you need to submit something to God. Maybe God has touched your heart about something. Maybe, maybe tonight you just need to understand it. And, and, and don't be surprised if you've never done anything like that before, that it feels a little awkward at first. But as you get confidence in, in what God can do to help you overcome those, those tempting thoughts and those things that are trying to knock you away from God and knock you off course, trying to disrupt your walk in the Spirit, the more victory you get, the more confident you'll get in that. Like anything, it takes practice, it takes an understanding, it takes uh, learning just these basic things. It doesn't, it's not a matter of, of words as much as it is, it is our heart being submitted to the Lord and getting the victory that we need in whatever area of life it is. Learn to walk daily with the Spirit. That requires a defensive measures against Satan. When he comes knocking at your door, trying to put pressure on you, when he tries to knock you and I off course, we can say, no, I'm not going there. People have literally ruined a whole day, a whole week, a whole month of their lives because Satan has gotten them going down the track and they can't seem to put the brakes on of negative emotions and thoughts and and that just always leads to bad choices that leads to bad consequences and, and it just gets worse may we tonight as God's people get the victory and fight the battle necessary Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to preach and do pray that what was said tonight was understood and applicable to every person here tonight, that the victory could be found, that we could have the help that we need so that we can continue our walk in the Spirit and enjoy the fellowship that you desire to have with us. May you bless our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. And thank you for being here tonight. Just a couple quick uh, things. Uh, we do have the sign-up sheet for the Christmas caroling event coming up. And then uh, we do this Saturday do have outreach. Uh, uh, Neil will be heading that up this week as I, I'm going to be getting back from being out of town. But uh, we have cards that, for the candlelight service and I think a few left for the home for Christmas. And if we can start getting those out, uh, that would be much appreciated. And uh, our next service will be officially in December. And uh, the last month of the year and lots of opportunities to do some things for God as we kind of finish strong. So I hope that you find something to do, get involved with, and uh, let God use you the rest of this week, however it might be, uh, to bring him glory and honor. So there's Andy. I'll let him dismiss with a word of prayer. And uh, have a good holiday. Enjoy your Thanksgiving. I hope you don't get too stuffed. Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this night. We thank you this time that we have in your house to be able to worship you. We thank you for your this and your mercy upon our lives and for your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that um, you would help us uh, to be submitted to you and live a life of fruitfulness and abundance, um, walking in your spirit. Please help us to uh, be aware of the devil's tactics. May we put on the full armor of God so we can protect ourselves from his and also combat the attacks with weapons such as uh, prayer and your word. And if um, negative thoughts um, continue to plague our minds, help us to resist the, that 
I can't talk right now. Resist those with praise. Pray that you would help us to um, gain victory in our Christian lives, that we may be able to uh, win others to you and glorify you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed. Have a good Thanksgiving. Thank you.